welcome to atcm the emergency medicine channel as part of em rapid 2024 myself dr priti matthews first year pg resident will be briefing you about intestinal obstruction intestinal obstruction is the inability of the intestinal tract to allow for the regular passage of the food and the bubble contents secondary to either a mechanical obstruction or an adynamic ileus so it is the obstruction to the passage of the bubble contents and the bubble contents as you all know it might contain the food the gas the gastric juices the pancreatic juices so to all these contents there will be an obstruction and this obstruction can be either due to a mechanical obstruction that is it can be either due to an intrinsic or an extrinsic factor or on the other hand it can be due to an adynamic ileus mechanical obstruction always requires a definitive intervention and a dynamic ileus is usually self limiting now coming to the classification of obstruction you can always classify the obstruction on the base of cause that is as we have already mentioned it can be dynamic cause and an a dynamic cause based on the duration you can classify into subacute obstruction acute obstruction and the chronic obstruction based on the location you can classify into small bowel obstruction and the large bowel obstruction now coming to the causes in mechanical causes are any tumors stenosis hernia abscesses and in a functional causes are the muscular dystrophy the endocrine disorders such as diabetes neurological disorders amyloidosis all these are the most common causes of the intestinal obstruction now based on the location if you classify the uh, obstruction the main causes are when there is an obstruction in duodenum it is mostly caused by stenosis foreign body strictures and superior mesenteric artery syndrome in case of small bowel obstruction the most common cause is the adhesions and then any hernia intussusceptions lymphoma polyp stricture gallstone ileus all these can also cause small bowel obstruction coming to the obstruction in the colon the most common cause is the carcinoma then it can be also caused by fecal impaction ulcerative colitis sigmoid bulbulus diverticulitis intussusception or pseudo obstruction now coming to the pathophysiology of the intestinal obstruction as you can see that when there is an obstruction in the bowel there will be an intraluminal accumulation of the gastric biliary and pancreatic secretion as a result the intestine will fail to get absorbed and the bowel becomes more and more congested this will cause vomiting and decreased oral intake in a patient thus there will be volume depletion hemoconcentration and an electrolyte imbalance in the patient hence what will happen is that in the lumen the pressure will get increasing the absorption and the lymphatic drainage becomes more and more decreased and the bowel becomes ischemic and finally it will go into bowel necrosis leading to renal failure and shock in the patient so this is the core concept what is happening in a patient is explained through this pathophysiology so every time you see an intestinal obstruction pa patient this is the pathophysiology happening in the patient that initially there will be accumulation of all the bowel contents that is the gastric biliary pancreatic secretions the food particles the gas all will get accumulated in the bowel and thus what happens there will be no absorption of the bowel contents so the bowel becomes more and more congested and in this time what will the patient's presentation will be patient will be presenting to you with vomiting and decreased oral intake so when there is a decreased oral intake it will lead to volume depletion hemoconcentration and electrolyte imbalance and thus what happens the absorption part completely comes down lymphatic drainage will come down and then bowel will go into ischemia and necrosis and finally patient will go into shock stage now the presentation of patients as we have just now mentioned the first and foremost symptom with which the patient will be coming to the er will be nausea and vomiting so as a result of this nausea and vomiting patient will typically see taking the oral foods the liquids etc and thus 
the characteristic features of the vomiting when we ask the patient it will be usually bilious if the obstruction is proximal and usually in large bowel obstruction it will be fecalent so the must known uh, symptom of an intestine obstruction is the nausea and vomiting which will be bilious in the proximal obstruction and which will be fecalent in distal ileal or the large bowel obstruction second symptom patient can have is the cramping abdominal pain and it is always associated with small bowel obstruction and usually it will be peri umbilical and cramping with paroxysms of pain that will be occurring every four or five minutes so it will be like episodic pain and mostly it will be peri umbilical pain a progression from this episodic pain to a more constant pain that there we have to suspect a peritoneal irritation which are related to the complications like bowel ischemia and bowel necrosis so when the pain is usually episodic and then becomes constant we have to look for the complications in the patient a sudden onset of severe pain may suggest acute intestinal perforation and the pain will be very less intense and more constant in cases of a dynamic ileus so that is what we were dealing with the pain so pain always you have to look in the patient when it becomes very constant and very severe always look for the complications such as the peritonitis then the patient will be complaining about obstipation that is cessation of the passage of stool or flatulence and that will indicate to a complete obstruction so however passage of flatus of feces can continue for 12 to 24 hours even after the onset of the obstructive symptoms now coming to the examination of the patient presenting to the er with these symptoms we when we suspect the ob intestinal obstruction we should be looking for these uh, features systemic signs such as the patient will be having signs of dehydration so patient will develop signs such as tachycardia orthostatic hypertension reduced urine output and if it is severe then they can be also dry mucus membranes now if the patient has gone into the complications then patient may will may have fever associated with infection so you have to suspect the complications of obstruction such as the bowel ischemia and the necrosis on inspection a variable degree of abdominal distension will be present and abdominal inspection should always examine for any surgical scars that would indicate a prior abdominal surgery and also you have to look for hernia so in cases of prior surgery we know that there is a chance for adhesions to happen so look for any surgical scars so that we know that there was any prior surgery also look for any associated hernia and patient will have most commonly a distended abdomen on auscultation with significant bowel distension bowel sounds may be muffled and the bowel will progressively distend so bowel sounds will become hypoactive so as the bowel gets distended and distended we get muffled bowel, uh, bowel sounds coming to the abdominal palpation you have to identify any abdominal wall or groin hernias whether there is any abnormal uh, masses which in the setting of a small bowel obstruction it can indicate any abscess valvulus or tumors as the source of obstruction so you will have to look for any abnormal masses in the patient we can also elicit tenderness guarding and when tenderness and guarding is there in the patient we will have to always suspect uh, the features of peritonitis in the patient and on then percussion a distension of the bowel will be resulting in hyperresonance or tympani to percussion throughout the abdomen however fluid fill loops will result in dullness so if the percussion over the liver is tympanic rather than dull then it will be indicating of free intra abdominal air tenderness to the light percussion suggest peritonitis then coming to the digital rectal examination in a case of intestinal obstruction suspicion we will always have to do a digital rectal examination that should be kept in mind and it should be performed to identify whether there is any fecal impaction or any rectal mass as the source of obstruction and on gross examination if you can find the gross blood it may be related to some intestinal tumor ischemia inflammatory mucosal injury or intussusception
so these things has to be kept in your mind so whenever you examine a patient look for the features of the intestinal obstruction now coming to the lab parameters so uh, when we suspect intestinal obstruction we have to do a complete blood count with differential counts and usually we see leukocytosis with neutrophil predominance and it indicates bowel complication so anemia may also be there uh, if it is due to some specific etiologies like crohn's disease meckel's diverticulum or any tumors then we have to look for the electrolytes including the blood urea nitrogen that is the bun and the creatine although it is not specific for the diagnosis of the small bowel obstruction these studies helps us to know the severity of the hypovolemia and also the metabolite uh, abnormalities in the patient so as we have told the oral intake will be less patient will develop electrolyte imbalances like hyponatremia hypokalemia so in order to identify all those things always send an electrolyte uh, in the patient then we can go ahead with the arterial blood gas usually uh, if the patient is having severe vomiting patient will develop metabolic alkalosis but metabolic acidosis that is lactic acidosis also can be seen and in those cases we have to suspect complications such as the ischemia and if severe hypovolemia is there also they can be hyperperfusion to the other organs and cause metabolic acidosis so in case of vomiting if the patient is only having vomiting it will be metabolic alkalosis if the patient has gone into any complications or if the hypovolemia is so severe then the patient can also uh, present with metabolic acidosis that is the lactic acidosis then we have to look for the serum lactate that is uh, elevated serum lactate is a very sensitive marker but it is not specific for mesenteric ischemia uh, included in those with small bowel obstruction so but still you can send a serum lactate level to assess the patient then we can send for blood cultures so if there is any bacteremia so in order to uh, escalate or de-escalate the antibiotics we have to send a blood culture then we can also send procalcitonin that is if the procalcitonin is very uh, high we can suspect some complication happening in the patient so these are the basic lab investigations that we have to send one is the complete blood count with the differentials the electrolytes the arterial blood gas the serum lactate the blood cultures and the procalcitonin now coming to the imaging in intestinal obstruction so the most and first and the most important uh, imaging is the x-ray that is the radiography so we have to obtain a plain radiography in a patient if we are suspecting mechanical small bowel obstruction and in the uh, radiography that is in the x-ray if you cannot find the features indicative of the intestinal obstruction then we can go ahead with the ct of the abdomen and the plain radiographic examinations will be an upright chest film and an upright and supine abdominal films and then if the patient is not been able to be in an upright position then we can go ahead with the lateral decubitus abdominal film and in this radiographic film we will be able to see the free uh, air fluid levels coming to the x-rays uh, here i have given two x-rays so the first x-ray is the x-ray in the upright abdominal uh, position so here as you can see uh, this is the classical x-ray of an intestinal obstruction you can see the dilated bowel loops with um, multiple air fluid levels so if there is more than three air fluid levels then we will have to suspect intestinal obstruction and the second x-ray as you can see uh, it is an chest pa view and you can see air under the right uh, hemidiaphragm which is indicative of a perforated abdominal obstruction so these two x-rays we should know so whenever there is an intestinal obstruction alone there will be dilated bowel loops and multiple air fluid levels will be present that is more than three um, uh, air fluid levels will be present when there is a perforation you can correctly see in a chest pa view there will be air under the uh, diaphragms so these two x-rays you have to know uh, and then coming to the ct scan uh, 
सी टी ऑफ द एबडोम शुड बी पर्फॉम्ड विद इंट्रावीनियस कॉन्ट्रास्ट इफ देर इज नो कॉन्ट्रा इंडिकेशन सो ऑलवेज वी प्रिफर सी टी विथ कॉन्ट्रास्ट सो दैट वी कैन ऑल्सो नो वेर वेर द सैट ऑफ ऑब्सट्रक्शन इज सो इफ वी डू सी टी प्लेन वी कैन ओनली नो दैट देर इज एन ऑब्सट्रक्शन टू नो द एक्सैक्ट सैज द लोकेशन वी कैन ऑलसो गो अहेड विद द सी टी विथ कॉन्ट्रास्ट एंड फॉर पेशेंट्स विथ सस्पेक्टेड Uh, complete small bowel obstruction based on the clinical evaluation or uh, based on the radiography oral contrast uh, should be omitted because when there is a complete obstruction then there is no need for a contrast in such patients if you give the contrast it will not add to any diagnostic accuracy and also because why these contrast does not reach the site of obstruction and also it will be a waste of time it will add expenses and also the patient will have more discomfort due to the complications like vomiting and aspiration so if you are suspecting a complete obstruction then need not go for a ct with contrast you can have a plain ct but if you are suspecting a partial or intermittent small bowel obstruction you can go ahead with contrast because here it will help in your management because you can correctly identify the location of the obstruction so uh, if a plain uh, radiography that is x ray doesn't helps you in uh, picking up the intestinal obstruction then you can go ahead with ct scan if it is a complete obstruction plain ct is enough if uh, it is we are suspecting a partial or an intermittent small bowel obstruction then we can go ahead with ct abdomen plus contrast now coming to the ct findings always an abdominal ct is superior to the plain radiography for detecting the signs of bowel ischemia and in the ct these features will be present that is poor or absent segmental bowel wall enhancement delayed hyper enhancement bowel wall thickening small bowel fixes sign air in the bowel wall and the mesentery will be edematous thickened mesenteric vessels will be engorged in the mesentery you will be able to see hemorrhage portal or mesenteric venous gas and increased free fluid levels will be noted so if you take all these signs individually they will be highly sensitive but they are not like specific but a combination of these findings will be increasing the reliability of the diagnosis so these are the most common ct findings and you should know that always they will be absent or poor bowel wall enhancement or a delayed uh, hyper enhancement will be there in the ct now coming to the other imaging modalities abdominal ultrasonography also may be useful for the diagnosis of small bowel obstruction in patient who cannot undergo ct scan due to the contrast allergies or if the patient is pregnant or if the patient is critically ill and cannot be transported uh, for the ct so the study has to be done on bedside uh, then we prefer abdominal ultrasonography then we have abdominal mri that is uh, specifically indicated if the patient is uh, pregnant so in those cases you can go ahead with the abdominal mri now the for patients with clinically suspected chronic or intermittent small bowel obstruction uh, we can also go ahead with the fluoroscopic guided endoclysis so it is the second best study after the abdominal ct but usually nowadays uh, we don't use this because of the need for small bowel intubation so we prefer uh, the ct only but if you are suspecting a chronic or intermittent small bowel obstruction you can also uh, uh, go ahead with the fluoroscopic guided endoclysis ct or mri endography is also useful that is mainly useful in the case of crohn's related small bowel obstruction fluoroscopic small bowel follow through also can be used that is always used when you want some functional information and uh, it has also been replaced by the abdominal ct so other than our radiography that is the plain x rays uh, and the ct you have other modalities such as abdominal ultrasonography uh, abdominal uh, mris the fluoroscopic guided endoclysis the ct or mri endography and finally the fluoroscopic small bowel follow through so all these investigations helps you in identifying and picking up the intestinal obstruction in a patient now when a patient comes to the er 
with uh, features of intestinal obstruction as an er physician what we have to do so first and foremost keep the patient on npo and if the bubble uh, is very much distended and patient is having continuously vomiting then you have to decompress the bubble with a nasogastric tube and immediately plan for an imaging so we also has to administer broad spectrum antibiotics if we are suspecting complications in the patient and also uh, give the patient iv fluids and the electrolyte correction so these are the primary things that has to be done in in er so always remember to keep the patient in npo uh, put a nasogastric tube in case of distension uh, suddenly we have to transport the patient for the imaging then give a uh, proper broad spectrum antibiotics also give the patient iv fluids and the electrolyte correction now coming to the complications of the intestinal obstruction the patient can have dehydration as we have told because due to severe vomiting patient might uh, not take oral intake so patient can go into features of dehydration causing electrolyte imbalance patient can develop intra abdominal abscesses intestinal perforation complications leading into peritonitis sepsis and multi organ failure before we wind up the session just to conclude the key features of the ileus and the bowel obstruction in cases of an adynamic ileus the pain will be mild to moderate and in case of mechanical bowel obstruction it will be moderate to severe the location in a dynamic ileus it will be a diffuse and in the mechanical obstruction we will be able to localize where the obstruction is coming to the physical examination patient will be having a mild distension with or without tenderness and decreased bubble sounds in case of a dynamic ileus in mechanical obstruction there will be mild distension tenderness and high pitched bubble sounds coming to the laboratory investigation there will be features of possible dehydration in a dynamic ileus while in bowel obstruction there can be leukocytosis coming to the imaging in a dynamic ileus they can be the imaging can be normal but in bowel obstruction you will be able to see multiple air fluid levels and the treatment part in a dynamic ileus it is always conservative management just observe the patient and hydrate the patient well but in bowel obstruction you will have always have to keep the patient in npo give nasogastric tube and take up the patient for surgery so these are the things that you have to remember in case of an intestinal obstruction always remember the clinical presentation of the patient what we have to do in er as an er physician and the management in case of a dynamic ileus and the mechanical bowel obstruction hope you all have understood what i have briefed you about the intestinal obstruction thank you all